Welcome this morning to the worship and the fellowship of Delisle Community Chapel. If you are here today, please relax, enjoy the presence of Jesus. He is here. He loves you, and so do we. Now, these are interesting times. We continue to work our way through this long-running COVID pandemic, and uh, we have some people here in the sanctuary at the church and others watching from home or wherever. We're going to start today, for the first time since all of this began, to have junior church. And I know we have a number of children with us today who are excited about So after the music, we're going to call you forward. We're going to have a prayer for you for the kids and for the teachers. And then when you go down to junior church, you're going to go down through this door, all right? And go on downstairs. We need to be careful to self-distance as children as well as adults. Of course, family groups can be together, and we see that we do have families sitting together this morning. Also this morning, we have an interesting situation in that... Uh, Carlin and Laura Lee, who usually provide music for us, are not here today. They got a call this morning that uh, all of their cattle are uh, out. And uh, so they're out uh, on a roundup today. And we hope that that goes well. You know, life is full of its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns, in the words of the poet. So. Uh, we're going to make the best of this situation. We're going to have music that's been prepared by others, and we're going to use that in our worship time today. I am going to read this morning Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. And it goes like this. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. This is psalm from God's Word, and I believe it expresses much of what we know to be true in our own lives. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for this Sunday morning. Another day, another gift, another opportunity. Here we are to worship you and to fellowship with one another and encourage one another in the process. We ask God that this hour together would be something that would prepare us for the week ahead, to be the people that you created us to be, to be a blessing to others, to serve humbly and experience the joy and happiness that come as a result. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray, amen. We have more children with us today. We have missed you guys when you're not here. And today, I know you've come largely because you know that today is the first junior church of the fall season. So what I'm going to do before we send you out is I would like to pray for the kids and for their leaders. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father God, I want to thank you so much for the children. Thank you that they are not only the church of tomorrow, they're such a very important part of the church today. We pray that you would bless them in their special time together. Be with their leaders. 
help Becca, especially as she coordinates our junior church program. Provide her with all the teachers and helpers that are needed to do the job right for our kids. We want to make sure that they receive a good, strong Christian education, that they learn early in life that Jesus loves them and church is a happy place. Bless them now as they go downstairs. Make their time as special, as precious, and as meaningful as that of the adults upstairs. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So kids, we're going to dismiss you now for junior church, but we want to do it in a careful way. So we're going to have one of your leaders come and hold the door open up here, because you're going to go down this way. That way you won't even have to touch the door as you go down. All right, and we'll just leave some spacing between each one. And children, all those junior churchers, come on down. There you go. God bless you. Come on, girls, aren't you coming? Yes, indeed. All right. Wonderful. There come a couple young men wearing their masks. All right. It's, it's great to have the voices of the children in the building again, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's excellent. I want to read a short passage from the Gospel of Matthew. The passage that we read is uh, an interesting one because in this passage we find the authority of Jesus being questioned. Questioning the authority of Jesus is never a good idea. We pick it up, Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 23 and reading through to verse 27. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say, from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say, of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. This is the gospel of our Lord. The message that I have for you today, I have entitled, The Path of True Happiness. Everyone wants to be happy. Show me a person that claims that they don't care about being happy, and I'll show you a person who's not much fun to be around. And they're probably a bit of a grouch. Now, the American Constitution states that everyone has a God-given right to the pursuit of happiness. But the pursuit of happiness does not guarantee a happy life. People have all kinds of ideas about what will make them happy. Young people think that if they just had the right girlfriend or boyfriend, then they'd be happy. Some people think that if they just had a better car or a nicer house, they'd be happy. Some people think that if they could just finish school, they'd be happy. Or if their kids would listen when they tell them what to do, then they'd be happy. All kinds of things that people anticipate could make them happy. You know, if they were just rich and famous. But look how that works out for some folks who are rich and famous. It doesn't guarantee happiness. Happiness is such an elusive thing. It has a way of staying just 
out of reach when you pursue it. However, there is a path which leads to happiness. If you will follow it, you will find that happiness is found not just at the end of the path, but all along the way. The path of true happiness is laid out in the Apostle Paul's letter to the saints in Philippi. Although the Philippians were the original recipients of the letter, it was written for our benefit too, wasn't it? If that were not so, it would not have been included in the Bible. All of the scriptures are written for our benefit. As I was studying Philippians chapter 2 and preparing for the message this morning, I was amazed at how clearly a particular Bible class that I attended years ago came back to my mind. I remember sitting in college under the instruction of one of my heroes, Herbert Peeler, who was the principal of Miller Memorial Bible Institute now called Miller College of the Bible. He was a great man of God and a wonderful Bible teacher. And Philippians, the book of Philippians, was his special love. And I can remember him pointing out to us that in the book of Philippians, the major theme and focus is on one little word. The key word in Paul's letter to the Philippians is joy. The word joy and its derivative, rejoice, are found repeatedly throughout this letter. Now, some people go to great lengths to explain the difference between joy and happiness. But the two words are synonyms, which means that they have much the same meaning. They mean pretty much the same thing. I want to be happy and joyful. Don't you? I want to be joyful and happy. And if you want to be joyful without being happy, well, I guess that's up to you. But I must caution you, it's very hard to do. Today I want to take you through Philippians chapter 2, where together we will discover the path of true happiness. Philippians Chapter 2. The first four verses read this way. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, before we go further, I want to remind you that this letter was written to people who are saints. What is a saint? A saint is a Jesus follower. People who have a relationship with Jesus that is real and personal. Now, if that includes you, then this message is written to you. If it does not include you yet, I have good news for you. You can make a decision today to follow Jesus, to confess your sin, to receive his forgiveness, and to become a child of God, a saint. The chapter begins with a little word, the word if. If you have any encouragement from being in a relationship with Jesus. Now, for those of you who are Jesus followers, let me ask you. Do you find it encouraging to be in a relationship with Jesus? Uh huh. Does the love of Jesus provide you with comfort? Sure it does. If you know that the spirit of Jesus is with you and within you, does that inspire 
tenderness and compassion for others as a result? If so, well, you're on track. This is the key to unity within the church, the result of being connected to Jesus. You see, we don't actually get close together by getting close together, especially during this time of pandemic. We get close together when we all get as close as possible to Jesus. If this is the case, then, says Paul, make my joy complete. How do we find complete joy? By being like-minded. Now, that doesn't mean that we all think the same about everything. Being like-minded means that we have a mind like Jesus. By having the same love. The same love as who? The same love as Jesus. By being one in spirit and purpose. In whose spirit and purpose are we united? In the spirit and purpose of Jesus. By doing nothing out of selfish ambition. Isn't it easy to become selfish? To think only of What's in it for me? What will I get out of it? How will I benefit? Self-centered people are never truly happy. We begin to experience happiness by humbling ourselves and considering others better than ourselves, by looking to the interests of others as well as to your own. Are you a person who's constantly fighting for your rights, or are you willingly giving up your rights? for the sake of others. Here we come to a key verse. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Wow. We have the mind of Christ, the love of Christ, the spirit and purpose of Christ, who humbled himself and put the interests of others ahead of his own. When Jesus went to the cross, it was because he put our interests ahead of his own. From Jesus, we learn that the path of true happiness is the way of humble service. Verses 6 through 8 of Philippians chapter 2 say of Jesus Christ that being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. You know, the Bible says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Wow. Motivated by love, he put our best interests ahead of his own. And what was the result? The following verses tell us. Therefore, whenever you read the word therefore in Scripture, you should always look to see what it's there for. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wow. You see, the joy that Jesus experienced was the result of putting the interests of others ahead of his own. Paul goes on to say, therefore, there's that word again, therefore, my dear friends, 
as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. In other words, Paul's saying, you obeyed when I was there with you. Now I'm not there. I'm writing you a letter, but I'm counting on your continued obedience. Continue, he says, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act to fulfill his good purpose. Now, notice Paul does not say work for your salvation. We don't gain our salvation by working for it. What he does say is work out your salvation. In other words, the salvation that's inside of you, express that by the way that you live, by humble service toward others. Work out your salvation, for it is God who works in you. It's what God works into you that you now work out in your dealings with others. God is at work in and through you. And that is exciting. When you sense that God is using you, when you realize that God can do his greatest work through an ordinary person like you and me, that's a fantastic thing. I've been inspired by the words of Mother Teresa who said, do not seek to do great things. Seek to do small things with great love. Have you ever heard of a man known as Brother Lawrence? Brother Lawrence lived from, well, some places they say 1611, and other places say he was born in 1614. But be that as it may, it was a long time ago. Brother Lawrence was a monk who lived in Paris, France, in a monastery, a Carmelite monastery, where his responsibility was to help out in the kitchen. He was basically a cook or a cook's assistant. Didn't look like a very glamorous position. But Brother Lawrence had discovered a secret. He called it practicing the presence of God. And he wrote about how he practiced the presence of God in everything that he did, in every decision that he made. When he bought groceries for the monastery kitchen, he asked God to give him direction, even in the smallest of his choices. And he wrote about it. And after his death, some others of the monks took his writings and put them together in a small book called Practicing the Presence of God. And that book is still a classic. It's still studied today by people who want to live in the presence of God. Wow. You know, God cares about the attitudes with which we do our work. The attitude with which you work is important to God. In verse 14, it says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing. How are you doing on that one? Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. You'll agree with me, I think, that we live in a warped and crooked generation. Any newscast will quickly remind you of that fact. And so those who live with the attitude of Christ, who do all of their work without grumbling or arguing, stand out. People like that get noticed. In fact, Scripture says, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Wow. You want to be a star? Do your work. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. What was it, last year or so, that we had the, uh, the choir come from Briarcrest? And uh, many of us were involved in hosting those students in our homes. And uh, I guess because I helped in 
setting up uh, hospitality for those students, they gave me a little plaque. Or maybe it's because they realized that I really needed to be reminded. But the plaque they gave me is a quote from the book of Colossians, another one of Paul's letters, chapter 3 and verse 28. It says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. Whatever your work may be, do it for Jesus. Don't just do it for the boss. Don't just do it for the company. Don't just do it for the paycheck. Do it for Jesus so that you will stand out in a crooked and depraved generation where complaining and arguing is the norm. You will shine like a star in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Your humble service will give authenticity to your words when you tell people about Jesus. And others will be inspired to believe in Jesus too. Now we are told to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. To be willing to live lives of humble service. We understand that by doing so, we will experience true joy and happiness. But we are tempted to ask, is it even possible to live like that? Yes, Jesus could do it. But Jesus was 100% God, just like the Father. He was also 100% human, just like you and I. Jesus could do it. But could anybody else really live that way? In case we would be tempted to question whether it's realistic to live that way, Paul gives us the example of three people who actually did live that way. First of all, Paul himself. Paul says, verse 17, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul lived a life of sacrificial service. The result, he says, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And he gives an invitation and a challenge. You too should be glad and rejoice with me. In other words, live as I do, and you will experience the same joy and happiness that I do. And then he gives us the example of his protege, Timothy. You know the word, the name Timothy is, is still a popular name. I was three and a half years old when my brother was born and my parents let me name him. Now I think if I'd have come up with something like Schnooky, they wouldn't have gone along with it. But I wanted to name him Timothy after the Timothy in the Bible. And his middle name is Graham, after Billy Graham. Timothy. What does Paul have to say about Timothy? He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. What, is, what has Paul been urging these people to do, to look to the interests of others? Well, he says, Timothy's like that. He will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things will go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So Timothy was a person who lived putting the interests of others ahead of his own. And then Paul gives us a third example. A friend and co-worker by the name of Epaphroditus. For some reason, the name Epaphroditus didn't seem to catch on the way Timothy did. Do any of you know anybody named Epaphroditus? No, I didn't think so. But Epaphroditus, too, is a hero. Here's what Paul has to say about Epaphroditus. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, 
who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. Now, we can understand that Epaphroditus came originally from Philippi. He was sent by the church in Philippi to take a message, but not only a message to Paul, but to take care of Paul. And he goes on to say, for he longs for all of you. He's away from home. He's looking forward. He's missing the folks back home. He's distressed. And why is he distressed? Because you heard he was ill. He wasn't nearly so concerned about the fact that he was sick as he was about the fact that other people were worried about the fact that he was sick. Indeed, he was ill, says Paul, and he almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. There's that word again and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Wow. This Epaphroditus was a hero. He was willing to risk his life to serve others. I got to thinking when I read about Epaphroditus. During this COVID pandemic, are you so protective of your own health that you fail to minister to others? Now, I'm not saying we should be reckless or careless. We should take proper precautions. But it's also necessary at times to take a risk in order to serve. Today, I want to challenge you to follow the path of true happiness, the way of humble service, modeled perfectly by Jesus, modeled by people like Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus and Brother Lawrence and Mother Teresa. And you could add to the list some of the people you know who live that way, finding happiness and joy as they serve others in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we've worked our way through the second chapter of this letter to the Philippians, we realize it's also a letter to us. Jesus, we want to have your attitude. Your very life within us makes it possible. Your spirit. Your spirit lives in us. And so we can and we will live lives of inspiring service, putting the interests of others ahead of our own. Thank you for the example of Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus and so many others, saints through the years, who have put Jesus first, others second, and themselves last. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.